That's what the Lord Jesus should become to us. Our love for him should be something that increases every day of our lives. And so we're going to look at three things from verses 14 to 18. God became a man. God proclaimed by John the Baptist. He shouted about it. He raved about it. It was the very essence of why he was born and the reason why he existed uh, to point men and women and boys and girls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And lastly, God revealed. God revealed only in Jesus Christ. Not, I'm not saying that because I'm a Christian, but because it is the truth. You cannot come to God the Father without coming through God the Son. And you cannot come through God the Son unless the Holy Spirit enables you to do so. And so it's so very, very important as we look at these verses before us this morning. The Word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us. When I was baptised in Front and Gospel Chapel, my uh, pastor and his wife bought me a book, uh, J.C. Ryle, The True Christian. And in the flyleaf, they inscribed these words, with all our love and prayers that the Lord Jesus will become increasingly precious to you. And I've often looked at those words, and it came in, you, as it did then, it often comes into my mind, well, how does Jesus become increasingly precious to us? John, in his gospel, helps us. Uh, the whole reason why John wrote uh, this gospel is found in the words that you read in chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. You know these words well, but they're worth just reading again because it gives us the reason why John wrote the purpose of this book. Now, Jesus did many other <coughs> signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the most important thing, isn't it? That we have life in his name. That we, we don't just have the knowledge of God. We don't just have an experience of God that leaves us cold and dead. That we receive life. And life is, 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 is important. It's the difference between being alive and being dead. There's a big difference, isn't there? Being alive to God means to be in a relationship with him. And that's what the gospel is all about. That was John's purpose. His purpose was to bring the lost. Jesus came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. And, and uh, those words come from that account when he met that little man, Zacchaeus, who was despised and detested, a tax collector. And it, I'm coming to your home, Zacchaeus. Saved him. Changed him. Changed a, a mean-spirited, horrible, conniving man into a child of God. Changed his life around. That's what Jesus does. It's incredible. That's why Jesus is to become increasingly precious to us. It's not about religion. Religion is, is that's cold and formal and dead. It's absolutely rubbish. I mean, if, if it was, you know, why would you want to meet on a Sunday if you didn't know the Lord? What would be the point? unless you were seeking him with all your heart. And sometimes we don't realise we're seeking him, do we? What happens to us is that we go through our lives and the Lord brings disappointments, he brings heartaches and griefs and sorrows. And, and before we come to know him, these have a purpose, they're to wean us from the world and the things of this world so that we may regard him and his son as precious. That's the things that matter in life. But also... The purpose of this book is to strengthen and assure those who love the Lord, to build them up, making them know his love. Knowing that he is the pearl of greatest price. Isn't it wonderful? 
I have lots of little bits and pieces. I, my uh, wife says to me, it's an old man's bedroom. It's got, I've got all things, you know, watches and I'm not going to go give a go a, I'm not going to give you a, a manifesto of my room. I, I think it's absolutely marvellous. I, 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 I like, but those things, they're just things. And uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, though some of the things my children will see as being uh, of some value, and some of them, my grandchildren will look at them and say, oh, I'd like that, you know. Uh, the majority of it is just going to be put in boxes and probably taken off to a charity shop at the end of the day. Even this little watch, I, I think I, I love it. I love listening to its tick and that, and, and to me it's precious. But it's not as precious as Jesus. It's not as precious as him. And that, that's, that's where we, we should be aiming, to wean ourselves from the things that, that charm and... and, and uh, the things that we enjoy, and there are, we are to enjoy these things. It's good to have lovely things around you, but they should never take the place of Jesus. And so John, in his prologue, verses 1 to 18, is enthused, he's, he's captivated by the love of Christ. Here's a man whose life was changed by Jesus. And if your life has been changed by Jesus, you will... Read these words, and the possibility is that you've read these words so many times that they, they just become something that you read. They are, to me, those things that are to evoke from our hearts worship. We, we, we're speaking about great mysteries that we will never fathom or understand. And yet, in a sense, uh, we're given some understanding of these things. They're like an overture. I, I, I love listening to classical music. And uh, if, if you've ever heard the, the Hebrides Overture by Mendelssohn, or uh, one that I really like is the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and, and you get all these little Germans at the end, and they're, they're owed to joy, and, and you know, it, it, it sort of lifts the spirits. And if you like, here is John's Ode to Joy. He's joyful in the fact that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's profound, isn't it? But there is a correlation here between these words, deliberately so, and Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. And there's no, God doesn't give any explanation about, this is how I went about creating the universe in which we live. He doesn't do that. He, you know... These are miracles and wonders that you will never... Your minds are too finite. Here is things that is, are infinite, beyond human understanding, and yet you can understand them by the things that you observe and see around you. The, the universe, the heavens declare the glory of God, the beauty of creation. I, all my pet loves, I mean, I love animals. I mean, dogs and things like that, aren't, aren't they absolutely marvellous? These creatures that have understanding and yet they're not human. These blessings that we have, uh, the trees, the field, even the, even the insects bar gnats. I don't like gnats. But, you know, but they have a purpose, don't they? Some, somewhere along the line. I mean, that's one of the unfathomable things I can't work out. But uh, gnats. But the intricacy. Isn't it interesting that when Pharaoh's magicians tried to reproduce and replicate a gnat, that's where they fell on their faces. They couldn't do it. Because there are things that are beyond humanity. And so here we have God, who always has been. The Word became flesh. And what we see is that God who was with the Father, God who was with the Holy Spirit, in the bosom of the Father, became flesh. He became a, a real human being. Uh, we're coming up to Christmas and uh, the nativity and, and the, the, Jesus Christ was born a proper baby, a proper man. I always wonder when, you know, how, how weak and helpless he was, but can you imagine uh, the protection that he had around him at that time. He himself 
weak and vulnerable. But can you imagine legions of angels that surrounded God's only son to stop him from coming to any harm? And he never came to any harm, did he? And it is an amazing thing that God made himself so very vulnerable so that he can help the vulnerable and the weak. And it is what things are all about, really. It's a, the mystery of the incarnation. God coming to live in a human body with a human soul. Why? Well, that hymn that we sang by, you know, you who are rich beyond all splendour, of course, many of you recognise that's from Philippians chapter 2, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be held on to. Laid, that, laid aside his majesty, came and became a man. With all that that means, tempted, yet didn't sin, credible. My friend, is Jesus precious to you this morning? Do you love the Lord? doesn't matter how much you understand of theology or church history or anything else in the world. The main thing is, do you love the Lord? That's sufficient. Sufficient to save you. Sufficient to take you to glory. But the other stuff is necessary because it enhances your understanding. What else do we see in these verses? Well, the second thing from this verse we see is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the picture there is of the body of Jesus being described as a tent or a tabernacle. And when you read the uh, Old Testament and you read about the uh, journey that the Israelites made through from, to the Promised Land, and they were command, Moses was commanded to build the tabernacle and the holy place and the most holy place where the presence of God, the glory of God would come and dwell. And then when they eventually settled in the promised land, you have in Kings and Chronicles the, the lovely, beautiful description of Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple in all its magnificence. But the, it wasn't the building that was magnificent. It was when... Solomon was praying and the priest had to retire because God came. And what we need in our nation today is for God to come in all that might and power and infuse and diffuse himself. And so we have here something that is miraculous. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He tabernacled amongst us. Solomon's temple is nothing compared to this. But it was a foretaste of the greater glory. God taking up residence in the man Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And more than that, this man being a living temple. Destroy this temple, he said, no, I'll raise it up in three days. And after he had been risen from the dead, they understood what he meant. He wasn't talking about Herod's temple, he was talking about his own body. But you say, so what? What relevance does that have to me? It has every relevance whatsoever. Because this is the thing. Because the Holy Spirit indwelt Christ in all its, his fullness, he now comes when we turn from our sins and place our faith in him. When we come to faith in Christ, we receive life. Real life. And that life means that each and every Christian here this morning is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And you say, so what? How does that help me in my life? It helps you in this way. He leads you. He guides you. He knows your deepest sorrows and your deadliest woes. He, he knows your joys. He, it's, it's real living fellowship. But more than that, it goes beyond this life, doesn't it? You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that when we die, that this, this earthly tent in which we live in is destroyed. It's either going to be buried, maybe you drown and die in the snow. I don't want to be too grim. But, you know, whatever happens to your body, that doesn't really matter whether it's buried or cremated. It will be raised again like our dear Lord's body, because we are, we are 
the temples of the Holy Spirit. God himself, by his spirit, tabernacles amongst us. We have fellowship with him. And that, that's the most important thing. As the tent of this body, was his body was destroyed through crucifixion and didn't see corruption. So all those who Jesus says, when we place our faith and trust in him, receive eternal life beyond the grave to know that one day we will rise again. That's a wonderful sort of thought, isn't it? To think of that. Because he lives, we live. And actually, we enjoy eternity now. Heaven on earth is when you become a Christian. Because heaven penetrates. The kingdom of God is within you. And so we experience, we will experience bodily, physical resurrection to live uncorrupted, sinless lives, glorified. When we see Christ, we will be completely like him. And yet, the mystery is we will retain our own unique personalities. But then there's another side to this. What if you're outside of Christ? What if you're not a Christian this morning? You'll be raised corrupted to face the judgment for your unforgiven sins. That's the, you know, that's, that's, that's just a, a real... No, of sadness, isn't it? That there are men and women who are oblivious to the fact that they will stand before God and one day, you know, I spoke to a, a, an area manager that I had once, and uh, Colin, and uh, he, he was saying, when I meet God, I'll tell him a thing or two. I said, Colin, you won't, you won't, you won't be able to speak. You won't be able to speak. And there are so many people that think of life beyond this life as some one wild party that they're going to enjoy like an MS advert or something and you know they, they you know and, and, it, and it is a sad that's the way the devil deceives and dupes people the reality is it's death the second death the reality is it's being separated from the love of god can you imagine you meet horrible people in your schools and in your places of work and when you retired you meet them on dog wall you meet them all over but there is thankfully by God's goodness and common grace, they are really nice people, but you meet them. Imagine being plunged to a place where you're going to live with those people who hate and are avaricious and deceitful and, 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 and there's no love and there's no niceness and there's no niceness and that's for all eternity. And that is hell. And hell is a real place and you should avoid it by all costs. And it's something that This is why this is such a wonderful passage of scripture. Because Jesus tabernacled amongst us, we can live among, with him for all eternity. There is no need for anyone to perish. No need for anyone to perish at all. The gospel is, is for, offered to every single living creature in the world. That beautiful scripture that we we read earlier god made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of god and, and paul's be reconciled to god today is the day of salvation why should we believe in him why is jesus to become more precious to us well, the next piece in the the third thing that we see in this first verse is john's testimony uh, an eyewitness account verse 15 John bore witness about him this is John the Baptist and cried out this was he of whom I said he who comes after me ranks before me what did John see he, he saw the son who came from the father full of grace and truth They saw his glory. That's just wonder, isn't it? You see, we may look back in the Old Testament and we read about people like Moses. He had the privilege of standing before a burning bush and God spoke to him and revealed his name. And then, then we have him asking to see the glory of the Lord and he was only allowed to see the back of the Lord. He wasn't allowed to gaze upon the face of the Lord. 
And yet these disciples, John the Baptist, John who wrote this gospel, had the privilege of walking with Jesus every day. They saw the glory of God in human form. They saw the likeness of the Father replicated in Jesus' everyday life, in his miracles, in the fact that he could still the storm, in the fact that he could raise the dead, but more than that, in his kindness, in his love, in his compassion, his holiness, his integrity, his righteousness. It was more than when they saw him at the transfiguration. It was more than when they saw him crucified or the resurrection. His wisdom and the beauty of his life that he lived. That's why Jesus could say to the crowds, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because they had seen the Father in all his beauty in human form. Something else. Jesus full of grace and truth. Light that lit up everywhere he went. They say that about some people, don't they? When they come into a room, the room lights up. But more so with him. He was like a, a spring of fresh water on a thirsty day. He was one who came and, and uh, sat with those who were outcasts and sinners. He was one who loved men and women freely. He was one who asked the children to come near to him when the disciples were turning them away. he have never seen anyone with such love and compassion in the whole world ever, ever lived or existed. And the disciples saw that. And John particularly is a disciple whom Jesus loved. And so this Lord Jesus, the water of life, the bread of life, that which satisfies and refreshes his grace and his glory. And this is the beautiful thing. We are privileged to be able to love the Lord Jesus just as John did. John who wrote the gospel, but also John the Baptist. Isn't that great? We can have this relationship with him. And it's something that you should be looking to do. Well, secondly, this morning, God proclaimed something to shout about. And in the brackets in the NIV, it says that, doesn't it? John shouted, you know, when you're excited about something, you shout, don't you? You know, I'm, I'm not going to trivialise it by saying, you know, when you're watching a football match. But, uh, you know, when, when, when you're a dad for the first time and you, 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 your son or your daughter is born, that's something to shout about, isn't it? Your wife's been shouting longer, but... <laughs> I saw a, a, a hilarious uh, uh, clip on YouTube the other day. Uh, there, was, there was a lady and she was saying, uh, we're, she, with the phrase, we're pregnant. And uh, then she went through all the things that women go through that men have no idea of. <laughs> and said, at the end of it, she says, we're pregnant? <laughs> you know, and, uh, but, you know, men do know that, that, that elation, don't they? And... Uh, Something to shout about. and some, What we see here is, is John the Baptist. John the Baptist, from even before he was born. Isn't it incredible? In Elizabeth's womb, we read that he leapt at the sound of his Saviour's voice. And, and the life that he led uh, far away until he was called to do his ministry. A voice of one crying in the world, must prepare the way of the Lord. And, and, and the, John, John is an example to all preachers, really. He must increase that I must decrease. It's, it's you know, behold the Lamb. It, you know, John never for a moment thought of retaining his own disciples when the Lord Jesus arrived. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful picture of a man who is so Old Testament and yet so Christ-like in his appreciation of these things. He testifies to the Lord's pre-existence. This is what he shouts about in these verses. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. Now John was born first. But he's not talking about natural birth, he's talking about the fact that here is his God and Saviour who is walking upon the earth in human flesh. 
And John saw that quite clearly when even people like John who wrote the gospel didn't understand it. John understood that before he died. Testifies to Jesus' fullness and grace overflowing into the lives of others and as if we receive him. John who points people away from himself. Look at verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's the application, if you like, of what John is saying. He who comes after me was before me. This is not just another prophet. This is not just another good man. This is someone who is actually superior to the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, Moses, who gave the law. The law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so here is a contrast. The law, which is holy and good, cannot save. But what does it do? Romans and Galatians tell us it, it highlights sin. We are to keep it. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and our neighbours, ourself. But we find that we fail. Here is someone who came with grace for failures to help us because he fully obeyed the law. A contrast that Jesus saves to the uttermost. That's beautiful, isn't it? There's nothing greater than this. You could say the guttermost. The very fact that no matter how low and despised or corrupted you are in your life, there is hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope for someone like Vladimir Putin, strangely enough, isn't there? No one is beyond the pale of redemption. God in his grace. That's the difference. The law is, is wonderful. It's holy. It's right. It's true. But it can't save us. Obedience to the law may enable you to live a good life, but it, is, it lacks the power to save. Only Jesus, who is full of grace and truth, can save because he fulfilled the law on our behalf. If you haven't already come to Christ, why don't you come to him now? Receive him as your Lord and Saviour. Finally, God revealed. And there are a number of scriptures that I won't turn to them. 2 Timothy 6.16, 6, uh, John 6.46, Matthew 11.27. God revealed only in Jesus Christ. And, and we, these words are incredible. No one has ever seen God. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, what does it not mean? Because people have seen God, haven't they? When you think of Adam and Eve in the, in the, in the opening chapters of Genesis, they walked with God in the call of the garden. Whether he, was, whether he manifested himself in any physical shape or form, we're not told, but they, they felt the presence of God, certainly. Abraham received visitors. One of them was God. There were theophanies throughout the Old Testament. Moses, uh, at the burning bush, Moses, when he saw the glory of the Lord, the back of the glory of the Lord. Uh, Moses hidden in a rock, not allowed to see the face in all its fullness. Then what about the, uh, the elders of Israel, the 70 elders of Israel and the priests? They ate and drank at the top of the mountain, sapphire courts and, 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 and beauty, outstanding beauty. So this verse doesn't mean no one has never seen God. Now what does it mean? Well, he goes on to say, no one has ever seen God. The one and only God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. That's where the, the picture becomes clearer, I hope. It's a picture of deep tenderness and filial love. It's a closeness. It's one of God the Son and God the Father being indistinguishable, yet distinguishable at the same time. It's one of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being one divine essence. 
and yet three separate personalities. And, and it, I can't explain that any further to you this morning because it's, it's so mysterious and it's so wonderful. But it is of oneness in mind and purpose and heart. And it isn't a picture of, of any disagreement at all. It's of, it's of the complete harmony that was supposed to pervade the creation and will one day pervade the new creation. And what we see here is a picture of the son reclining on the, on, the, on the breast or on the bosom of the father. So close, the relationship between them is indistinguishable. And yet it is distinguishable. And the truth about God is always expressed anthropomorphically, isn't it? In other words, because God is spirit and is everywhere present throughout the universe, the infinite God is is everywhere. It's expressed in language so that we can understand it. So the hand of God, the arm of God. And, and so in, in this way, we are not looking at three persons with, with bodies. We're looking at God who is spirit. We're looking at the close fellowship that exists within the Godhead that is a great mystery. Only... In other words, what we're told here, this is why we, this is so important. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only God who is at the Father's side, has made him known. He alone expresses the heart of the Father. He alone expresses the heart of the Father. I and my Father are one. They are one in their desire to see men and women and boys and girls saved. They are one in their desire to see God glorified. They are one in their desire to, through recreation, proclaim the glory and being of the one who clothed himself in flesh. Is Jesus more precious to you this morning? <coughs> no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only at the Father's side has made him known. He made him known when he said to that dying thief, today you will be with me in paradise. He made it known to us when we were still his enemies. He died for us. He made it known when he rose from the dead. He made it known when he ascended into heaven. He makes it known when he will return again in glory and in power and take us home to be with himself. Thou who art God beyond all praising. 